Welcome to Textination. Joining us is Rick Salmon, photographer, author, educator, and who knows what else, musician too, I think. Well, thank you so much for having me, Fred. It's always great uh, talking with you. You do a great job. It's fun seeing you at the shows. So thanks so much for having me on the show. Well, you've got some great new stuff to talk about. First of all, let's talk about the, the latest book uh, that you have out that you did, I think, with, you, with your wife, Susan. Talk yes, Susan it. Sam is a co-author on this, and uh, it's, uh, it's fun working. It's fun working together. And this is called The Route 66 Photo Road Trip, uh, How to Eat, Stay, Play, and Shoot Like a Pro. Yes. So it's not only about photography, it's about how to eat, how to eat in uh, great places, where to stay, some romantic hotels, you know, from the 50s and 60s on Route 66, you know, how to take pictures and, you know, how to how to have a really great trip in about a week. And you did this, when did you actually take the trip or was it a, a, an accumulated kind of thing? Yeah, we did uh, two trips, one about... Uh, five years ago, and then we did one, uh, the follow-up, after we got the book contract, we went back, we uh, went last year. And uh, both trips are only about a week, but, you know, we hit, we hit the ground running, and photographers, as you know, we have to chase the light. So Susan and I would get up early in the morning, we'd chase the light, uh, get the pictures, save, download our pictures, and uh, get on to the next spot. Wonderful. So tell us uh, what... What you went through on, on Route 66. Tell us a little bit about the route. Sure. Well, first of all, there's no more official Route 66, unfortunately. Uh, U.S. Highway killed it. And shortly after the highway was opened, you know, Route 66, which was the main way to get across the country, basically died and was abandoned. So what you do is you drive a, a long U.S. 40, and you see these brown signs, historic Route 66. So there are dozens of places where you turn off, and it is, Fred, it's like going back in time. You know, they have the old cars, they have the the vintage buildings, the neon lights, you know, from the 50s and 60s. So any of your listeners who used to watch uh, 77 Sunset Strip or uh, – <laughs> Remember that? Oh, I do. You're a kooky. <laughs> Ephraim, Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. And uh, and the other show uh, where the guys were driving around in the vet, uh, I think it was called Route 66. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's actually filmed in Canada. <laughs> Every once in a while they want a Route 66. But what we did is we, and this is what, uh, what, uh, what your listeners could do. Because it's easy. You fly into Albuquerque. Now, we didn't do the whole Route 66 because it starts in Chicago and goes to California. But what we did, what the book is about is what we call the prime cut of Route 66. So we flew into Albuquerque. Then we drove to probably the iconic hotel on Route 66, uh, the Blue Swallow Hotel, Motel in uh, Tucumcari, New Mexico. Then we went up to Santa Fe. And then we went to Gallup and a couple of other places. Um, and then we flew out of uh, Vegas. So it's a really easy trip. It's a fun trip. And, you know, people today, including myself, you know, I love going places, but getting on a plane, you know, and flying for like 12 hours somewhere isn't isn't fun <laughs> anymore. So Route 66 is just the kind of trip that anyone can, can take and, and have a lot of fun. And I think our book uh, shows people how much fun they can have. You have another book uh, coming out too soon, and I think people might be able to get a an early look at it on Amazon on the Oregon coast. Tell us about that. Yes, uh, that's coming out. Uh, the publisher was happy. Countryman Press was so happy that they uh, hired us to do a book on the Oregon coast. And, you know, this place is spectacular. If you love seascapes, the Oregon coast, you know, there are places like called Devil's Churn and Thor's Well and Devil's Punch. There's a lot of devils out there, like Devil's Punch Bowl. <laughs> no, there are Devil's Road. You know, there's a thousand of them. Devil's Turn Off. But the the crashing waves on the shore, it's just it's just uh, spectacular. So we just and uh, basically everything you just is off one road. Uh, I think it's Highway 101, the Oregon Coast Highway. So you just we flew into Newport and just drove down to Bandon. And again, we hit the hot spots, uh, showing people how to make pictures, where to stay, great seafood. I mean, you know, we're we're about an hour from New York City. We don't get great seafood up here. We have great seafood in New York City. Everywhere on the Oregon coast, they had great seafood. 
That's terrific. So, I mean, you're turning this uh, these books into more than just uh, information for photographers and, and yes. uh, would-be photographers. Well, absolutely. And yeah, because, you know, I've been taking pictures for a long time and there's so much free information on the web. Also, there's free information about where to stay and eat and all that stuff. But what I wanted to do is, and what my wife wanted to do, we wanted to put together like a companion, a manual, so people can, you know, they don't have to search the web and, you know, uh, and print out all this stuff. Everything's in, in the book. So, and, and we love traveling and having been to about 100 countries, actually a little more than 100, 100 countries, I think, uh, we're, we, you know, we have, we have some uh, skills that we've required, acquired after making, you know, some mistakes while we were traveling. Yeah, you know, traveling itself it can be a challenge. You kind of alluded to the hassle of flying these days, but I don't know how you manage it with with the uh, photographic equipment and well, uh, the need to safeguard it. Well, uh, fortunately, Susan, you know, Susan uses the iPhone, so if I have an extra lens or two, she's more than happy to carry it. But you're right; you don't want to ship anything through baggage these days. I do ship my tripod, but I keep my ball head with me all the time because if my bags are lost or delayed I could buy you know a tripod and then still use uh, uh, still use my ball head really really interesting now you just came back from another what sounds like terrific trip out to Utah give us a give us an overview and you're 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 helping people online learn about that right <coughs> yes uh, I'm an instructor on Kelby one so it's uh, kelby1.com, and they have a lot of online photography and video and Photoshop, <coughs> excuse me, and Lightroom courses. But again, I'm getting, you know, very into the travel. So we went out to Utah, and it's, uh, it's a photo and travel class. It tells you, like, where to go, what time of day, where to stay, the distances between, like, uh, Arches National Park, the distance to Bryce Canyon, Goblins Valley, you know, these goblins and devils are all over the place, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I guess they're popular at Halloween, and, uh, and, and Zion. But you know what, Fred? A lot of people love these pictures. I got so many com nice compliments on them, and I tell my photography students that never underestimate the importance of a good subject. Because if I had the same camera lens in my backyard photographing on, you know, like February 3rd, <laughs> You know, when, on a gray day when it, 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 no leaves on the trees here in Croton on Hudson, I wouldn't get any comments. So the subject, the subject is important. And in landscape photography, uh, one of the things we have to remember is that we have to cut the clutter. It could be so beautiful out there. We could get overwhelmed and want to capture the whole thing, but we need to cut the clutter. And the second thing we need to do is, for most of the landscape shots, and I think I could say this for Ansel Adams' photography and uh, one of the most la famous landscape photographers of all time, everything in, in the scene in his pictures and in my pictures is in focus. So I use a wide-angle lens, a small aperture, and this is going to sound backwards for a sweeping, you know, long-distance landscape, but I focus one-third into the scene. So, if a la so I want the viewer to feel like he or she is there. So that's what, in all the pictures, this is what I do. I want it to look like it looks to my eyes, everything in the scene in focus. Really terrific. And, you know, you mentioned it in your backyard with the bare trees, but I bet you'd get a great picture there, too. I can almost imagine the silhouette with the sun in the background. But uh, Well, actually, I, I did get one good one. I, I tweaked up the color a little. But uh, but the subject, well, same thing with the model. You know, I have models up here in my studio. They get a lot of nice comments. You know, if I did a selfie in the same studio, <laughs> it wouldn't get as many comments as a beautiful model. And so seriously, the subject, the subject is so very, very important. Now, on this trip, uh, I understand, uh, and I, we, can, we can talk about this if you'd like, you used one of Canon's brand new cameras, a new mirrorless camera. Give us little overview of what your experience was like. Uh, we're going to be talking to Canon soon about that. Sure. Well, when the first mirrorless camera came out um, several years ago, I said, I'm never going to switch to mirrorless because I looked in the viewfinder and I just didn't like what I saw, you know, the electronic viewfinder. So this is a big improvement. So 
So I love the the viewfinder because you know, like fighter pilots have like those heads up displays. Sure. You know, they don't have to look down. So looking through the viewfinder and looking at the uh, the monitor on the back, the LCD monitor, you know, you could see whether uh, you could activate. It. You could turn it off too if you want, but you could see that if the horizon line is level, and you know, your in camera light meter is your histogram. So you could see this. So this is cool. And you can see your exposure compensation, you know, whether you want to make a scene darker or lighter. So that's one of the things that I really like about this, seeing that live histogram in the viewfinder. Plus, because the lens is actually closer to the image sensor, you get a sharper picture. I have a picture on my wall. I'm looking at it. It's a 24 by 36 that I took out there. Uh, it's a handheld H in-camera HDR and the in-camera HDR, and for the listeners who don't know what HDR is, it's uh, it's called high dynamic range photography, where the camera takes three pictures at three different exposures and merges them into one. And you could do handheld uh, HDR pictures with this camera uh, at a lower shutter speed because the mirror is not flopping up and down to um, cause camera shake. So you get sharper pictures for that reason and be at slow shutter speeds and because the lens is closer to the uh, image sensor. And uh, the weight of the camera is typically a bit less too, so it's easier to carry <laughs> around on a trip? Well, it's a bit it's a bit less. Uh, if you put the battery grip on it, because all mirrorless cameras use more battery power than digital SLRs, because you're looking at the screen and the viewfinder, um, it's just as heavy as like my Canon 5D Mark IV. But the touch screen on the back is uh, is is amazing, and uh, that heads-up display is kind of cool. I think some cars, I think some BMWs and Mercedes have that actually in their cars too. Cool you know, stuff. Where you can look at the viewfinder and the uh, look at the windshield. Yeah, it's giving you all the information because it's electronic right there. Yeah. Well, so it's the future. Mirrorless is. I think mirrorless. Is, oh, this also has a flip-out screen, which is kind. You know. One of my tips is, and I think uh, we talked about it last time, you know, use your camera like a drone. Move it up and down because if you photograph everything at eye level, it gets boring. So with the flip-out screen, I could hold this way above my head and flip the screen down so I could see it. And I could hold it right down on the ground and flip the screen out so I could see it. So, Are you uh, getting into this drone photography, Rick? <laughs> a guy came over here, Fred. A guy came over here with the drone because I was into it. So before he launches the drone, he goes on an app, and he has to see if there's any traffic in the air. So he has that app. Then he has, then he has, a, he has a big iPhone. Uh, so then he goes on the display for the drone. And I'm sure it's easier than it looks, but they were like, you know, it looked like 37 controls that you needed to use. So <laughs> are you into the drone photography? Because I know you love photography. Well, yeah, I've, I've played around with it some. Uh, and uh, it's, it's getting better and better, and they're getting easier and easier to fly because of all of the uh, technology they're building into it to prevent us from destroying the drones, <laughs> protecting yeah, but, us from ourselves. Yeah, but they're getting easier to fly but harder to use, meaning, like, you can't use these in national parks. Right. I went to Africa. They say you can't use it in this place. So every place I would really want to use a drone, I can't use it. Yeah, a, a, a lot of restrictions. I found this which same is point. good. Which is good. I, I was on a trip recently, and I looked a, ahead of time at the restrictions, and I decided, you know what, I'm not going to bring the drone because of, because of those restrictions. It just wouldn't pay. Yeah. So the fall season is here, um, and I guess um, before we let you go, we're going to tap into your mind uh, for some tips for people uh, sure. who want who want to get out there and capture some of the beautiful fall color. Well, uh, again, in landscape photography, what we want to do is cut the clutter. So you could go out to a be the most beautiful landscape filled with, like, you know, the, all the colors of the rainbow. And you might want to capture the whole thing because you're seeing it and you're having a great time. You get home, the picture is going to be a compositional mess. So we have to cut the clutter. We still have to have, like, a main subject. So if there's, like, one tree that's maybe more colorful, place that in the, in maybe off-center. Um, you know, think about your composition. That's very important. Uh, I think the prettiest fall pictures are when you're shooting into the sun, when the leaves are backlit, and they look like they're like plugged in, like Christmas tree lights. So, 
I would say try shooting in the early morning and late afternoon, and you get these back, these beautiful, beautiful backlit scenes. And again, the leaves can look like they're like you know plugged in. It's just so so beautiful. And you get warmer colors. You get even more more beautiful colors uh, in the morning and uh, in the afternoon at what's called golden hour. Occasionally, even the the overcast day. Can, well, the can overcast look good. day you can get some beautiful pictures also. So. I would recommend, and then, you know, the peak only lasts like a couple of days, so I would watch, watch for that peak. And and also, you know, when I when I give a workshop, we go anywhere. I say try to tell the whole story. So try to tell the whole story of uh, of the fall. Sure, take the beautiful sweeping landscapes, you know, but also go in for those close ups and get like a leaf on a rock. Uh, and you could also make pictures. I see a lot of pictures on on the web where like someone's photographing a beautiful stream and there's a rock there. I know the person put the red or yellow leaf there, but it's still a nice picture. The person made the picture. Interesting. Where's the best website that you would steer people to to learn more about what you're doing, Rick? Uh, I know you got you got a bunch of places, I think, and and of course there's the Kelby classes too. Yeah, uh, just Rick Salmon. It sounds like the fish, but it's S A M M O N. RickSalmon dot com, and uh, and I'm I'm here to help. I love teaching. You know, I really do enjoy teaching and sharing. Uh, uh, all all the pictures that I posted on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter when I was out, most I would say almost all of them had a photo tip in there. Terrific, Rick. Thank you so much once again for sharing all of that terrific knowledge. Well, thank you. You do a great job. Uh, I'm uh, proud to be on your show, and I'm proud to call you my friend, too. Thanks, Rick. Now this. How many companies out there have continued to innovate when it comes to building a better radio? I'm Fred Fishkin, host of Textination, and I'm here to tell you about the new CC SkyWave SSB radio from the wonderful people at C-Crane. Bob and his crew really love radio, and it shows in this new compact model that is packed with features. Beyond great AM and FM reception and sound, you can tune into shortwave signals from around the world. Listen to ham radio operators, aviation, and more. It's the radio you'll turn to every day and in emergencies. It will run for nearly three days on just two AA batteries. Pair the sleep timer with the new Soft Speaker 3, and you've got the perfect radio for your nightstand. Of course, it can wake you up, too. Click on C-Crane at Textination.com and put in the code Textination for a free flashlight with your order. They love radio, and you'll love C-Crane.